See, when I, I grew up in church, my, my parents were, uh, my mother got saved anyway the year that I was born. And it was pretty normal to go to church twice every Sunday. Who, who went to church twice every Sunday, morning and evening? Yeah, that was just standard. Uh, no one ever questioned that. No one ever thought it was too much. It was just, that's just the way that it was. We needed to hear preaching twice every Sunday. Now, upon reflection, um, I, I don't know. I don't know what the thinking was behind that exactly. I don't know if we need to hear preaching every, twice every Sunday. Um, if you love that, if you really love preaching, I guess you can do that. But um, it was really, I think, more about creating spaces for people to come and experience God, obviously experience family, experience community. Um, and, and people really enjoyed it. Um, <clears throat> But, you know, in thinking of, you know, all these times that we used to go to church, all that sort of stuff, I've been thinking about the Christmas story. Now, I've, I've probably preached the Christmas story, oh, I don't know. It happens once a year. So if I do my math, you know, sometimes I did series, so you got to factor that in too. So three-week series, all that sort of stuff. I've probably preached on this maybe 20 times, maybe 25 times. I don't know if you've heard the story before, but... You know, how many ways are you going to preach the Christmas story? Um, the characters don't change. Uh, it's basically the same thing every time, and there's no surprises because you've all heard it. So it's not like I can pull out some nugget that's going to be like, oh, I've never heard that part of the story before. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm constantly like, as I'm reading this story, obviously I'm asking God, what, what do you want to say? Like, what strike me with a part of the story that uh, maybe it's never really hit me before. And, and as I was reading through the story again, I guess the thing that really popped out to me this year was this sense of these people showing up in hope and faith, purely based on hope and faith. We know the whole story, right? We, we, we know all of the gospels. We know what Jesus becomes. We know how he dies on the cross for our sins, all that sort of stuff. They didn't know any of that. All they had was a promise. A promise that Jesus, that a Messiah was going to come. And, and the people in, in this particular story all went to see him in faith. Believing in something they couldn't see. Or they didn't know for sure. But they went anyway. All they had were these promises from the Old Testament. Uh, of one that was going to come. And, and, and I want to read one out to you this morning. Um, from the book of Isaiah. Uh, chapter 9. Did you guys like that, how culturally relevant I was? Um, Isaiah chapter 9, uh, beginning at, at verse 6, it says, For a child is born unto us, a son is given, the government will rest upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. His rule, he will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. These are the kinds of promises, and of course they're strewn throughout the Old Testament, that the Jewish people spoke of in hope, but no one knew when. And, and believe me, you have to understand that lots of people proclaim to be the Messiah. So it wasn't like this was a, a one-off sort of a thing. There were lots of people who proclaimed to be the fulfillment of the promises of the Old Testament. And so it was almost like if they heard about another one, it would be like, oh, here we go again. Sure, sure, you're the Messiah, sure. And yet this story stands out. And for the shepherds and the wise men that we read about in this particular story... We see them doing something in hope and in faith that we know now they were right. It was actually the right thing to do. He was actually the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He just happened to be a baby at the time. And so I want to talk about uh, what, what exactly it was that they did and what I guess the king still asks of us today. And, and the first thing is, is the shepherds. So the shepherds in the story are the ones, obviously they're out working, they're just out working. They're, they're not uh, significant in the sense that they were Christian shepherds. All right, these were not, so these, uh, these guys were not special shepherds, and, and, or they, they happened to be a unique group of people who really held closely to the prophetic words of the Old Testament, and that's why the angel came to them. They were just 
people. And the good news of this part of the story is he still comes to just people. Amen? Amen. We don't have to be elite. We don't have to be special. He just comes to each and every one of us. And he wants to meet with each and every one of us. And so an angel appears to a bunch of shepherds in a field. And it's quite, you can imagine it would be quite an extraordinary sight. Imagine how many times these guys told this story. Like for the rest of their lives. At any dinner table they would ever be around, you would imagine. Eventually, everybody would be, well, I bet you they're going to talk about it again tonight. That night, that night. When the angel comes, and it's not just an angel. An angel talks to them, but there is a host of angels that show up in a field one night to talk to these guys. This is what the passage says in Luke chapter 2, verses 8 to 12. That night, there were shepherds staying in the field nearby, guarding over their flocks of sheep. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them, don't be afraid. <laughs> Do you think that would help? I'm not sure that would help. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger or a trough, a feeding trough. And so this, this is the exciting news that the shepherds get, and then the, the, the angels all start singing together. And then they disappear. All right? Quite a celestial event. Now, what would you have done? If you could put yourself in that moment, what do you think you would have done? Do you honestly think you would not do what an angel told you to do? I'm not sure I would. Remember, they said they were terrified. So if an angel shows up and the Shekinah glory of God, this bright, overwhelming light of God surrounds you, I'm pretty sure you would do that. I would do that. So I'm, I'm, I'm just going to assume that they started organizing themselves to say, we're going, guys. We're going to do this. We're going to the manger. And they show up, and, and Mary and Joseph, as you can imagine, they'd be surprised that people showed up until they start talking about angels. The two people in the room who wouldn't be surprised by angelic visits would be Mary and Joseph, because they both had one, quite recently, actually. And so the shepherds start talking about an angel, and they're like, oh, yeah, us too. What did he look like for you? You know, like, they could have actually had this conversation. Nobody there is surprised by visitations by angels. And the shepherds make this decision that we're going to come. What do you even do? What do you think? Do you think they were planning? What, what are we going to do when we get there? What do you do? When you meet the Savior as a baby. What was the plan here? They just show up. And here's what I love about the story. All Jesus asks of us is to show up. You don't have to know what to do. Is that great news? Because sometimes when you come to church, you're like, I don't know what to do here. I'm not sure if I know all the right things to do. You don't have to know all the right things to do. They just show up. The king requires your presence with a C. He requires your presence. And the right thing to do to the king of kings and the Lord of lords is to show up. And understand that if he is king, it's up to me to go to him. Even though he was coming to us. Emmanuel, God with us. He's like, I'm going to show up so that you can show up. Isn't that great? And so the king still requires our presence. And the, and the shepherds did exactly what they should have done that night and modeled something for us all 
that all we need to do is not know everything or know all the answers or be perfect in every way. We just have to show up to the king. And then you have this unique part of the story of these wise men that come. All right? And I know you all know this because I've said it before, but there weren't three wise men. So you might want to write that down. If you're new here today, I'm sorry if I'm wrecking your nativity scene. But there's more. They weren't there either. They're not, they don't belong in the nativity scene. They belong in the story, of course, but they weren't there that night with the shepherds. Because it took them a long, long time to get to where they needed to go to see Jesus. It took them probably years. And so these are rich people who have read the stars. They're astronomers. They've read the stars and they recognize that all these things have come together and they they decide to, to purchase gifts befitting a king and they start on this journey. They start following a star based on the old writings and calculations of astronomy. They followed the star all the way to Bethlehem. This is what it says in Matthew chapter 2, verses 10, 11. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house, not the manger, not the stable. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother, Mary. And they bowed down and worshiped him. And they opened their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. This was an extraordinary story. This was a story or an act that most people in their lives would not have understood. So where are you guys going? Uh, Bethlehem, uh, we're just following a star because we believe that a child-born king is, is going to be there and we're going to give him really, really, really nice gifts. So we'll see you in three years. Do you, do you imagine that? Maybe you've never thought about it like that, but this is a big thing, a big journey to embark on, again, on faith. They don't know they're acting out in faith, and they embark on this incredible, extraordinary journey that would have been hard to explain to lots of people, I'm sure. And I think we kind of, because of our, all of our you know, Christmas productions, all that sort of stuff. And you see these three men, obviously there's always only three men with three gifts and they bring like a little bottle of something. And this is frankincense here. We walked for three years to give you this little tiny bottle of stuff. If you understand back then, the traditions of back then, they would have brought gifts fitting a king. So gold, we all understand, is a valuable thing. Yes, no one had to look that up. Is gold worth something? Yes, of course it is. Frankincense, I don't know. No one's ever given me any. And I'm sure it wasn't on any of your Christmas lists either. Mom, could you give me some frankincense this year? I'd really love some frankincense. It was valuable back then, though, more valuable than gold. So we think gold was the big gift. It was the frankincense and myrrh that were the precious things that were given more so than the gold and more valuable than the gold. But how much gold do you think they gave? Now, it's not highlighted here, and so what I'm telling you right now is not something I read in some book that you've never read in the Bible, all right? But traditionally, if you are going to bring a gift to honor a king, you would probably bring a gift no less than 50 pounds of gold. 50 pounds. Now, how valuable is 50 pounds of gold, you ask? I know that's what you're thinking, right? In the current market, 50 pounds of gold is worth $1.8 million. So when it says that they bowed down and worshipped him and gave him gifts fitting a king, these guys gave Mary in honor of Jesus Christ the King, in faith, believing he's the Messiah. At least $2 million worth of gifts. Maybe three. That's why we don't hear about Joseph anymore. No, that's not true. That's not true, all right? That's not true. But this was a big deal. This is not a little thing. 
And the reason why I'm highlighting this is because maybe you've never thought about this part of the story, but these wise men come and bring Jesus, the king, gifts fitting a king. And can I tell you today that what Jesus requires of us are gifts fitting a king, not leftovers, not our little bit, but gifts that he deserves, which is our everything. Not only are we meant to show up, but we're meant to give him what he deserves. Our gifts, our talents, our time, our resource, everything that we have, just like these men did all those years ago. They brought the king what he deserved. Not just little tiny bottles of something. It wasn't enough. And I would ask you again today, if you put yourself into their shoes all those years back then, would you make that kind of an investment purely based on hope, not knowing for sure if he's the one? That's big, isn't it? You can understand why Mary says, it says later on in that same passage, that she hid these things away in her heart. Because on the days where I'm sure she didn't believe, or when doubt was creeping in, is he really the one? Mary, did you know? You know the song. She held on to these things. Why would these wise men come if he wasn't the one? And so I have a challenge. Now, you all showed up today, so well done. You can give yourselves, yeah. You did it. You did it. Step one, tick. But not just at Christmas. And here's the challenge that I'd like to give all of you today. And as we look into 2024, maybe, maybe you wouldn't have gone on that night. I know we'd love to be real spiritual and say, oh, I saw I would have. I would have been there. Really, just based on hope and faith? Just because someone might have told you, yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure he's the right one. I'm pretty sure. Maybe you wouldn't have gone that night and bowed down before him and worshipped him. Maybe you wouldn't have gone a year, two years later with gifts fitting a king. But what God asks of you and I now is what are we going to do today? And what are we going to do tomorrow? What are we going to do next year? Are you willing to give the king what he deserves? Because he never changes what he asks for. And he never orders you to come. And so there's no like, if you don't do this, then. It's just an invitation. And that invitation is open to all of us every single day, all the time. Will you come? Will you come recognize him as king? Will you come bring all that you have to give to him? Will you surrender yourself? Because he's king. Will you keep showing up? Not because everything in your life is awesome. He doesn't say just come when it's good, but come every day. In fact, he says if you are tired and heavy burden, come. If you're going through struggles, come. If you're having a wonderful day, come. He's still calling us to come. The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. But it's our job to respond, not his. And there's no guilt in this and there's no shame. And, you know, if I looked at you, it's not because I haven't seen you enough this year. You better come more next year, okay? So I'll just look up here. <clears throat> It's just an invitation. And we know the story now. That baby grew up, showed us how to live, loved people, gave his life, died on a cross for you and I, and now sits at the right hand of his father. 
He is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. And He deserves us, all of us, to worship Him, to show up, to give our presence and our gifts to Him. Amen.